Okay, so which calories that count that we don't have to count, right? The ones you can eat pretty much liberally and abundantly? Fruits and vegetables? I got you. I got, before you even ask the question, fruit caveat. Fruit caveat. Vegetables are going to be your best choice to overeat. But here's the thing, who overeats vegetables, right? I do. Start doing it. Keep no, doing it. I, no, Keep doing no, it. No, but it's like. Yeah, but if they're cooked, if they're, be, we're gonna get. I'm gonna get into that later. About not eating, like even green, some green. Well, there's root vegetables. vegetables. There's yeah, there's starchy, starchy and not non-starchy vegetables. Yeah. Eat those liberally. Greens. Like I love like. Garlic, green onions. Peas, green, oh, I like all that too. Yeah. But I like like green peas. I mean, you know, like the sugar snap. Those see. I heard that now that the sugar snap peas are high in um, sugar. They're high carbs? in carbs. Maybe. I'll but I can say, But I would rather eat. I would rather eat that. Yeah. Than sit there and eat cookie. Yeah. No, I, I agree. That's that's excellent, and you're you're doing exactly what you should be. So, so the fruit caveat. Okay. No, we're gonna get into that. Don't worry. I got I got the answers. Okay. Believe me. Fruit caveat. So as I said, if you're going to eat, overeat one of them, it's veggies. But the thing about with fruit, though, is if you eat a variety, you're going to prevent overeating of a certain food group. That's why di diversifying <laughs> you your point. diet, diet diversity, creates variety. Variety creates moderation. Right? And so you follow the general guidelines, like whatever the servings are for fruits and vegetables. They have them out there, the health organization guidelines. Beans. It's the best carb for weight loss. That's what I was talking, saying earlier, but I was going to talk more about them. Beans equals skinny jeans. It's the best carb for weight loss. Now, what about the caveat with digestive difficulty? Well, first off, a person's internal environment is what it is. So where you are can impact how you respond to this food. So you can be sensitive to certain foods. You, if you thoroughly cook it, <clears throat> see, because beans have these... Um, plants have defense mechanisms, okay, against like insects and, you know, so, I mean, we can't blame the plant for trying to, like, you know, protect itself from being eaten from, like, insects and stuff. So we cook that stuff out. So that stuff leaches out of the bean into the water. And so if you thoroughly cook your beans, and even perhaps soak them for that matter, but I, I don't I actually get canned beans. I still haven't mastered how to actually cook beans and make them tasty. So, but also, there was a study that, you know, people talk about being allergic to nuts, like certain nuts, mm -hmm. peanut allergy and so mm -hmm. forth. There was a study that said that just because you have a single nut allergy doesn't mean you're allergic to all nuts. You can, you may, you might, so somebody might be allergic to peanuts, but they're perfectly fine with all almonds. So what I'm suggesting is, if you have a, a certain bean that causes, you know, bloating or whatever, find a bean that doesn't. And the one that I am aware of that doesn't, I think, is lentils. That's one of the softer beans to cook, and it doesn't take as long. But beans are going to really help with weight loss. Let me explain to you why. It's a three-fold factor. They're high in fiber. So I know this by memory. Most bean bag, like the, the, on the package of the beans, it's like 30, let's say it's 30 grams carbs. Whoa, that's a lot for half a cup, okay? Mm -hmm. 10 grams fiber. All right, so what you do is you take 30 grams of, of carbs, you subtract it by 10. In, in, in the diabetic world, it's referred to as net impact carbs. So now you've got 20 grams of carbs. So 30 just got down to 20. Still kind of high. Oh, is that how that's proven out? You take yeah. carbs less the amount yes. of fiber? Right. So but here's you're net carbs. That's part of it, but no. it gets better. Protein. Most dried beans, and cook, what, cooked and dried, have 10 or more grams of protein. Now, remember how I said protein is the most thermogenic, meaning it's the most satiating, but it's also, it's also the most thermogenic. Uh, what I mean by that is we expend more energy digesting protein. That's why it works for people. It's called the metabolic advantage because it, it creates weight loss for the thermic effect of digesting it. However, the fact that beans have 10 grams, we're at 20 grams of carbs, right? Now you throw in 10 grams of protein, we can pretty reasonably say now it's down to maybe 17 grams. Three grams probably get burned because of the protein. Your body has to digest the protein of the bean. You're at 17 grams, right? This is the unknown factor of beans. This is, this is the X factor. It's called resistant starch. That term's important, resistant. That means it's resistant to being broken down. Your body actually, it actually bypasses your small intestine and goes into your large intestine and it feeds the bacteria there. So we actually, and sometimes we actually will just eliminate it. We actually 
So now we can knock that 17 grams of carbs of the package of beans now to 15. 15. Now let's look at the macros. 15 grams carbs, 10 grams fiber, 10 grams protein. That's a paleo. That's a paleo protein bean right there. Resistant starch. People don't know about that. This is like a. What is, this is, okay, what is resistant starch right now? It's, um, it's, it's this substance in the bean that is resistant to uh, your digestive enzymes uh, to be broken down. Uh, so it bypasses your small intestine and your, lar and your large intestine, the bacteria feed it, and it actually improves your, uh, your, your digestive health. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so this is another th cool thing. See the exclamation point in the question mark? There was, uh, there's this channel, uh, nutritionfacts.org, it's Dr. Greger, um, he's a medical doctor. He found that, there was a study that actually found that beans reduce resting heart rate. Can you believe that? There was an association with bean consumption and having a lower resting heart rate. That's unbelievable. There was no other food that was associated with the reduced resting heart rate. It's pretty crazy. Also, it's a blue zone staple. So the blue zones, there's five of them. Those are the areas in the world that have the longest lived uh, people, like people who the highest ratio of, of uh, centenarians to. And so a cup of beans a day was one of their staples pretty much in all the blue zones. And those are in uh, Loma Linda, California, uh, the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, um, what's it, uh, Okinawa, mm. and, um, and then there's, um, what is it? Um, there's two others. Sardinia is another one. And then I'm, I'm uh, um, Icaria. I think it's like in the Mediterranean. Those are in the Mediterranean. All right, so this is coming back to what you said, uh, raw versus cooked. So about eating vegetables and how you, know, you eat a lot of them. Well, raw versus cooked. So raw is the slim down advantage. The next slide is going to illustrate that firm principle. The raw food thermic effect of, of, of food. Your body expends more energy breaking down raw food. So if you go more raw, you're going to lose weight because your body has to expend more energy. We absorb more calories when the, when the food's cooked. Because think of it this way, when the food's raw, it's, un, it's unprocessed, it's unbroken down. Your body has to do work to break it down. If it's cooked, it's already broken down. The heat, that pretty much digested and now you just absorb it, right? Raw food. A lot of people forget about that. More salads. Think salads. That's key. You should. Everyone should be having at least one salad a day. Everyone. Nutrient absorption. Um, that's one of the caveats, actually. Uh, there's some people who go raw food 100% and they actually end up getting deficiencies because of that slim down advantage. They end up uh, not absorbing as much of the calories. So some foods you want to cook, like beans. Some mushrooms, of course, like salad mushrooms, like white button is fine, but I think like certain wild mushrooms you want to cook. Mushrooms are really healthy too, by the way. Um, and then some foods are actually more available to be absorbed, like the antioxidants and tomatoes, like one of them is lycopene, which is fat soluble. So, and also, if one were to actually get too thin or you know, lose too much weight, <laughs> <laughs> kind of, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of building in the hopes up a little bit. Alright, so. <laughs> Cal, hey. Gotta, Who knows? You gotta shoot for the, shoot for the stars. You, you land on the moon. Alright, so calorie increase strategy, right? So if, the, if we're to. If you were, or nutrient deficiencies, you can cook some foods to increase. So a lot of people say, like, this is like. The person has a fast metabolism, like. Oh, I need to eat more calories to bulk up. I'm like, hmm, yeah, that's common with this common knowledge, and people say that. Why don't you eat more cooked food? So you actually don't have to eat more calories. You eat the same amount of calories, but you absorb more of the calories. Yeah. All right. So this is the Furman principle. He's this is his pyramid. So it's half raw, half cooked. Thirty to six percent of calories, vegetables. He gives a nice wide range. This is a much better representation of what the vegetable should be. That stomach slide. I think they were trying to paint a picture, but they yeah. screwed up with the picture by putting in some apples and grapes and stuff. But here, what looks like um, looks like we got some. Um, it looks like this broccoli. It's eggplant, carrots. Looks like radicchio, tomatoes, cauliflower, bell peppers. Looks like maybe fennel or celery. These are just different greens. 
Um, and then beans here and fruit. So also you want to think beans and greens. That will really help you kind of hit it, you know. Fruits here, whole grains and potatoes, seeds. And see, the thing I like about this guy, he doesn't exclude these foods. He just says minimize them. You know, like I was saying, use the chicken, fish as a filler rather than like a full, you know, something that fills the plate. So what are some satiety strategies? One to two glasses of water first thing in the morning or during a meal or before a meal. It doesn't have to be in the morning. It can be before a meal. Water is very satiating. It's a good technique. It works. By the way, um, if it doesn't work, oftentimes liquefied meals work, like soups and smoothies. Those things work. They're more filling to the stomach. I would say soups more than smoothies. So think soups and salads. It's going to fill volume. It's going to satiate you. Um, Fiber-rich foods like beans, nuts, and seeds, fruit, vegetables, and whole grains. One to two servings over. Remember, you got to be selective with whole grains. Eat more of this. Eat a ser enough servings of that. Eat enough servings of this, and then eat enough servings of that. Think of you know when people say you need to beef up. You know you need to beef up your diet or beef up your protein. The vegan version is you need to bean up your diet, bean up your protein. So think of beans as being the beef of. Uh, plant-based nutrition. So as I said, soups and salads. And nutrient-dense foods tend to also be rich in fiber. It just that they, they, they're connected. This is cool. Exercise snacks. Um, so it's good to take a walk or stand up and move around after you eat. It's not going to impair your metabolism. And here's a cool little test. If going into whatever you eat, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, if you ask yourself, can I get up and do 20 jumping jacks really hard and fast and will I still feel fine? If the answer is no, then we need to reevaluate what we're eating. If the answer is yes, you ate lean and clean, and that's good. You know what I mean? If you eat something too heavy, it's going to hold you down. It's going to weigh you down, literally and figuratively. But if you eat something light, you can. That's, it works, I'm telling you. So, when you eat foods that calorically dilute, you can have some rich foods here and there, you know. It's not like you're trying to deprive yourself, but you know, the whole name of the game is we want to actually try and make progress and see results. And so these strategies are, are, are proven that they will, they will work. It's not just for weight loss, it's also good for metabolizing the food. So if I eat a meal, I'm sitting like this, eating a meal, I'm sedentary, my muscles are not contracting. Hey, sir, you're more than welcome to come on and join us. Oh, hey, sir. Yeah, how you doing? Hey, what's up? Yeah, I'm coming from Yeah, absolutely. Good. So, when I'm sitting down, my muscles are not contracting. That's sending a, a that's, I mean, our body, like, you know, we're, we're, I mean, let's face it, we're, we're aging, you know, every day. So, our body is, functions. It, it has to function every day. And so, when we're sitting and you're eating, it's kind of like when your muscles are not contracting. It's like your body's just going to start, it, there's no movement, there's no... You're not creating demand for the food, so the body gets stored as fat. It's more likely to be more, more calories stored as fat. So if you get up and walk around, muscles are contracting. It's like the muscles are like chompers. Now it's like, what's that saying? Like, uh, closed mouths don't get fed. When you're sitting, you're, the, the mouths of your muscles are closed, not getting fed. So food gets stored for later. When you get up, move around, walk, the chompers are gone. Now you're going to start eating up some of those calories. You're sending a signal even if it's just walking or standing, right? And so those calories end up being, some of them actually get burned, contracting while you walk and stand, and you're sending a signal for your body to like store it as carbohydrates rather than fat. And it's also good from a health perspective. It's gonna blunt the triglyceride and glucose response that happens after meals. So exercise snacks. You can do this before or after. It's actually good to do before or after. Another thing too about a snack is before is, you know how when someone's at a dinner table, it's like, let's say it's a get together and someone, I don't know, stresses you out and you say, I just lost my appetite, you just like push, like push the plate away, I lost my appetite. That's a stress response, right? Exercise creates the same response. It's, it suppresses appetite. So whenever you do get hungry, you can do a five to 10 minute little walk or a little, some kind of activity. And you'd be amazed at how the art of distraction by not only doing it, but also what happens afterward is you're not as hungry. Now, some people do get hungry when they exercise, and I think there's a reason for that. Number one, genetics, but number two, 
If you don't exercise intense enough, sometimes it can make you hungrier. In which case, you have to go back to strategies that I talked about earlier, like drinking water. Because it's toxic hunger, which I'm going to get into, I think, here, hangry strategies.